she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I've been thinking about why do people celebrate Christmas? Now, some celebrate Christmas like us, right? Because we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came to be the Savior of the world, that he came to die for our sins. James Boyce, Montgomery Boyce, who was the pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, in one of his Christmas sermons says, we focus so much on the birth of the baby and on the sediment that goes with that story, and there is a certain amount of legitimate sentiment that goes with it, that we miss the most important things. Actually, the story is created treated quite simply in scripture and the emphasis is always on the fact that Jesus came to die on a Roman cross the Lord Jesus Christ the eternal son of God took a human body in order that he might die for our salvation we miss the most important thing about Christmas if we fail to see that so I've been asking this week and trying to think more about what, what does it mean for somebody who doesn't believe that, who, who doesn't see really Jesus as a part of the story, or sure they probably have heard it around, but that that's not what is important to them. And so I found on, on the Huffington Post a, a blog from a gentleman named Stax Rosh. He would consider himself an atheist. I'm just going to read this to you, and you see, this might be what people around you believe about Christmas. Many religious believers get upset during the winter season. Bill O'Reilly leads the outrage by claiming that there is a war on Christmas, and he is not alone. Many other Christians insist that everyone must keep the Christ in Christmas, while still other Christians flip out over the commercialism of the holiday. I have even seen a Christian go on a rant about how Santa Claus is of the devil. You, you do know it, that Santa is also can spell out Satan? Okay, well, anyways. <laughs> they go on a rant because Santa Claus is of the devil because he distracts people from Jesus. Everyone seems to think they know the true meaning of Christmas and that it has something to do with this Jesus guy. First, I object to the view that many Christians hold that the month of December belongs to them alone. Humanists, free thinkers, and atheists are starting to organize, and we are forming traditions of our own. Across the nation, we are starting to celebrate things that matter to us. Some atheists like to celebrate Festivus. Others like to celebrate the winter solstice, the, the pastafarian holiday of holiday, or the humanist holiday of human light. Sure, some of these started out as jokes, but atheists tend to have a great sense of humor. Interesting thinking here, huh? The bottom line here is that if religious believers get to, get to use county and state courthouses as billboards for their religions, then other people should be allowed to put up Festivus poles, flying spaghetti monster displays, and even a tree of knowledge if they choose. Christians and Jews aren't the only ones with the right to celebrate during the winter season. Second, at this point, it is pretty much common knowledge that Jesus was not born on December 25, and that the holiday of Christmas as we know it today was pretty much stolen from many different pagan traditions. In fact, many puritanical Christians may be shocked to learn that the Christmas wreath was originally a pagan symbol for fertility and that the Bible actually warns Christians against erecting evergreen trees in the home, Jeremiah 10. These things are true, by the way, folks. All right, just don't get too upset yet. Okay. Then, of course, there is Santa Claus, who, dare I say, isn't biblical. <laughs> the story of Santa, loosely based on a Catholic saint, is a mixture of folklore taken from Danish and G Dutch and German traditions with a tall glass of Coca-Cola thrown in. Yeah, Coca-Cola helped create the image of Santa Claus that we know and love today. 
My point here is that Jesus obviously isn't the reason for the season. Okay, now if you're listening to this online and you just tuned in, I am quoting from a blog. I'm not sharing this as my personal belief, so just keep listening. So what is the reason for the season? Many atheists joke that the reason for the season is the tilt of the Earth's axis, implying that the winter solstice is the true reason for the season. That it's funny and all, but it go, only goes one level deeper than the Christian view. Sure, Christmas was stolen from winter solstice and Saturnalia celebrations, but why did people celebrate those holidays? Here is the godless, honest truth. <laughs> Both the alleged birth of Jesus and the winter solstice are merely excuses to celebrate. Winter is often cold, it gets dark earlier, and trees have lost their leaves and appear dead. This is a depressing time of the year, and that can mean only one thing. It's time to party! The true meaning, true meaning of Christmas is to cheer people up during a cold and depressing time of the year. That means lots of food, getting together with family and friends, giving each other gifts, being kind to others, and helping those in need. Whatever excuse you want to use to celebrate the winter season is great. Jews celebrate a day's worth of oil that lasted eight nights. As excuses go, that's pretty weak, but it makes people happy. Great. Celebrate long-lasting oil, the tilt of the earth axis, the birth of a mystical figure, a funny episode from a sitcom, the flying spaghetti monster, sauce be upon you, human light or even Star Wars life day. Whenever you celebrate, Star Wars, there you go. Whatever you celebrate, have a happy holiday season. Personally, I like to keep the Chris, the Chris in Christmas. Then he quotes from Chris Hutchins, <laughs> who is an atheist. There are those who tell you at your age that you are dead till you believe as they do. What a terrible thing to tell children. You can only live by accepting an absolute authority. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you in that way. The world is celebrating, and it doesn't mean that they believe in God, especially in America. You know that we will spend something like $8 billion this Christmas, and it won't be about Jesus. Okay, it's really about people making money. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Martin Luther, speaking of this verse, says, if anyone stands firm and right on this point, that Jesus Christ is true God and true man who died and rose again for us, all the other articles of the Christian faith will fail in pl fall in place for him and firmly sustain him. So very true is Paul's saying that Christ is the chief treasure, the basis, the foundation, and the sum total of all things in whom and under whom all are gathered together. In him, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. On the other hand, I have noted, still Martin Luther, I have noted that all errors, heresies, idolatries, offenses, abuses, and godliness in the church have originally, have originally arisen because of this article or part of the Christian faith concerning Jesus Christ has been despised or lost. Clearly and rightly considered, all heresies militate against the precious article of Jesus Christ. And what does Matthew say? She will give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. And she will give birth how? A virgin birth. How's that possible? A virgin birth. How can we even understand that? By the way, a virgin birth, a, an incredible birth, a birth that, that didn't involve a, a man and a woman, but instead involved God overshadowing. Not, by the way, as some of the, some of the, 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 the various mythologies said, that some, some God-like figure had sex with some human figure. That's not how. But that the Spirit of God placed himself within the womb of a human being named Mary. Is it impossible? 
Well, I have to tell you, Debbie and I celebrate every day we get to hold little Theo because he's a miracle birth. He's a birth that didn't happen naturally. He's a birth that happened because doctors have the ability to place an embryo inside the womb of a woman. And that's what they did for, for Jen and Phil, an embryo placed inside the womb. Wow, look at that. How, did, how could they have done that? because God did it. He placed himself within the womb of a virgin. And, and, it's, and it's been prophesied. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, what did Isaiah say? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, a sign that he's at work in history, a sign that he's coming to the world. And what is that sign? Isaiah said, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and, she will call, and he will call him, they will call him Emmanuel. And it's quoted in our text, isn't it? Matthew's account of the lineage of, of Jesus through the line of Joseph, of, of course. In fact, if you look at Matthew, you have the, the lineage of Jesus through the line of Joseph. Then go over to the Gospel of Luke, and you have the lineage of Jesus according to Mary. In okay, case somebody says, well, if, he, if Joseph isn't Jesus' father, then how could he be the son of the king of David? Well, then you go over and you look at Luke, and you'll see that the lineage from Mary also follows underneath the lineage of the king, king David set up and established for centuries, Matthew 1.18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and you did not want to expose her public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce, divorce her quietly. Can I just pause there for a moment? Do you want proof that this was a virgin birth? Look at Joseph. Look at Joseph who says, this is my bride. I've already been betrothed to her. We're in that year long, get to know one another, not have sex time of our marriage. It's before we've actually had the final unions, before the covenant is complete. But yet I'm already committed to her. The public knows that. In fact, we have this year that we have to get to know each other, just to, to, to build a relationship, not have other responsibilities. What a wonderful thing, by the way. Year-long honeymoon. Okay? Only it's all before all the intimacies and all the other spirit, sexual commitments and all those other kinds of things. It's a time of just building relationship. Wow, what a gift. That's what, they, that's what betrothal was for them. But Joseph says, I know I haven't had sex with her. So I know it's impossible for to be, her to be having a baby through me. Therefore, the law says I should actually have her stoned. Well, I, I want to try to meet the law a little different way. And, and Joseph comes up with a way. He says, okay, I'm going to divorce her. I'm going to do it privately because I don't want her to get stoned. I don't want her to be killed. I still care about her. But I'm going to do this privately so that it protects her. But the fact is, that's not my baby, and I know it. Evidence. Evidence of a virgin birth. There's been no one else in her life. There is no other person. There's no other relationship. She's just been there. And God has come upon her and placed himself within her womb. Let me continue verse 20. But after he had considered this, after he's saying, okay, okay, I can't marry her because that's not my baby and I, I don't know how this happened, but I, I got to get out of here. But after he had considered this, the one thing that changed his mind was an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. And you, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive, give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. And what a great declaration. What a name. 
Emmanuel, God with us, a promise that God is going to be here. When, and we don't even have to ask him to come. He's promised to be with us. That's who he is. And notice, would David have come up with a dream like this? Excuse me, would Joseph have come up with a dream like this? It, this is not the kind of thing you would ordinarily dream anyways, right? If you even, if, if some of you like me, you don't even remember your dreams. Okay. And if you do remember your dreams, would you really remember, okay, I um, had a dream last night, an angel of the Lord appeared to me, told me that uh, this birth is from the Holy Spirit. No, you wouldn't even come up with something like that. I mean, just not happen, okay? Even if you'd seen a movie the night before, which Joseph hadn't been watching movies, okay? So and, and if you had some kind of, rec- it wouldn't have happened, except that God had come and spoken to him through that angel. And it's one more evidence. This is a virgin birth that God is orchestrating as he has throughout all of history. By the way, Luke, in speaking of this in chapter 1, also verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, By the way, notice, has Mary been planning this? Uh Uh-uh. In fact, the very fact that this angel is there talking to her has her, Oh, no. What's this message about? I, I know you just said I'm wonderful, I'm favored, but why are you here? She's troubled by this fact. This is not something she's conjured up on her own. But do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. By the way, you you realize this is before Jesus lived and died, right? This is before he's born. This is before the Holy Spirit's come upon her. All these things are being said that are prophetic. She doesn't have any expectation of this. This is totally different than the way Messiah has been revealed throughout history and throughout centuries and from the prophets. God is changing something in a dynamic way that has been unexpected. And he's changing it right there with Mary. And how does Mary respond? How will this be, Mary asked the angel? Since I am a virgin. Okay, I hear you saying God's going to favor me, God's going to bless me, and I'm going to have a son. How's that possible? In our world, people have to have had intercourse in order to have a baby. I haven't done that. How am I going to have a baby? More proof of the virgin birth. Mary herself says, This is impossible. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. You see, folks, the virgin birth is required for a couple reasons. First, the virgin birth is required for Jesus to be divine. If Jesus is born of Mary and Joseph, what is he? Not the Son of God. Oh, he could be a son of God like we are invited to be sons and daughters of God and all, but he can't be divine unless God has come into that womb himself. Can't be because of Joseph and Mary. Secondly, it's required that Jesus be divine in order for him to come and die for sin. Because if he's born of Joseph and Mary, he is born as every other human being has been born into sin. He is born with original sin. Like every baby that comes, we all come here not perfect, even though we appear perfect and we're little babies, right? We're innocent, and yet we are born into sin. Every one of us sins and falls short of the glory of God. We'll come back to that verse in a few moments. But in order for God to save us, in order for God to pay the price of sin, God has to come and God has to die. No one else can do it. No one else is without sin. And what did 
What did Matthew say? You are supposed to call him Jesus. Joseph, you're supposed to call this baby Jesus. Do you remember what the Greek, well, the Greek word for Jesus is Jesus? But if you translate that into Hebrew, do you remember what the name is? Yeshua. The contracted form of Yehoshua. What does that sound like? Yehoshua, Joshua. It means Yahweh is salvation. God is salvation. And in the shorter form, Yeshua, the stress, and now I'm going to quote from uh, William Hendricks, and he says, in the shorter form, Yeshua, the stress is on the verb, hence, he will certainly save. Jesus comes as Savior. Jesus comes, and he is going to save us. John 1, verse 10 said it this way, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him, Yeshua, who's come. He's come, but the world doesn't recognize him. Or go back to verse 1 of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I know that there are certain religious people who try to say, no, he was a God, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses. Oh, no, he wasn't God. And they try to, to eliminate the, the, what that's, what's being said there in John 1. But it is as clear as day that John is saying Jesus came as God. Not a little portion of God, not just a blessing from God, not like all the rest of us. He came totally different. That the creator of the universe, that the one who was there before the beginning of time, that in the creation God spoke, that's the word, folks, that the word becomes flesh, dwells among us, full in grace and truth. That God has come. That's what John is trying to say. That's what Jesus is, that's what Joseph, excuse me, is being told by the angel. God's coming in a son in your son that you're going to take care of for the next few years, that you're going to teach and that you're going to love Joseph. So don't be afraid to take him as your son. Don't be afraid to, to finish this marriage betrothal with Mary. Don't divorce her because God's coming in Yeshua, the Savior. And what does he say? Because he's going to save his people from their sins. Romans says, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not a single person among us who hasn't sinned. Born in this world as a human being, born of mother and father, every single one of us has sinned. Not just the person next to you. You have personally sinned. And what is the, the wages? What is the cost of that sin? The, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And we all die. But not only die physically, but there is a death that's coming later when Christ comes back. It's a death that separates us from heaven. It's a death that separates us from God forever. All who have sinned fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that death, that sin, is death, judgment. See, the Bible says because, because we've all sinned, then all of us, all, every one of us is separated from God. And we need a Savior who will come and take care of, die for, pay the price, take the punishment, fulfill the guilt offering so that we can be set free. He will come to die for our sins. How will he save us? I would encourage you to read Isaiah 53 again during this Christmas season. Isaiah 53, which describes this suffering servant who is the Son of God, who will be despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Take a look at Isaiah 53 and read that as you try to, to think again about the Christmas story. Yes, it's wonderful he came as a baby. Yes, it's a beautiful time. Yes, they hear the shepherds out there in the fields by, by watch by night watching their flocks and the angel coming to them and the singing of them and the glory to God in the highest. Yes, enjoy all that. And, and treasure along with Mary all these things that she's pondering as shepherds come and a couple of years later, wise men come from the east and, and a star is overshadowing them. And there's this, all this incredible prophetic stuff that's taking place. Celebrate that, that. Ponder that in your own heart. Treasure that as well. But don't miss that Christmas does not stop with the baby. That Christmas has its meaning. That the gift is really here in the cross, not in the manger. 
that they go together. That because God came in human form as a baby, came as a servant to be ransomed off to die on a cross is what makes the manger significant. How will he save us? Isaiah 53, verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I appreciate how Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. How will he do it? By dying on a cross. John Henry Hopkins, a 19th century writer, both words and music, wrote a familiar song that we sing at times. Let's see if you can figure out which one. Because this is from verse 4 of this well-known song. Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume breathes a life of gathering gloom. Sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone-cold tomb. You know what it's from? Even the wise men knew that the Christ child they came to honor was put on earth in part to die. It's a part of our heritage as Christians to join in the hymns written by brothers and sisters of older generations. Because most hymns or contemporary praise songs tell a story, we often miss the main point if we sing just the first verse or the chorus. In the example above, every reference to sin and salvation is found in verses after verse 1. We need to sing more than just the first verses of carols. I want you to listen to a couple of questions by a pastor that uh, used to actually be here in Crestline. He was the pastor of Lake Gregory Community Church years ago. His name's Stephen Cole. He now pastors in Flagstaff, Arizona. Been up there for a number of years. And in speaking to this text, he says, are you one of his people? If you ask, how can I know? The answer lies in answering some other questions. Has God opened your eyes to see that you are a sinner who deserves his judgment? Now, don't just listen to this rhetorically, folks. Don't just hear these as nice words being quoted about another pastor. But I really want you to examine yourself and ask yourself these questions. Has God opened your eyes to see that you are a sinner that deserves his judgment? If you think that you're a pretty good person in God's sight, then you're not one of his people. At least it has not been revealed to you yet. But if you say, yes, I know that I'm a sinner deserving of God's judgment, then the next question is this. Have you fled for refuge from God's judgment to the cross of Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in his shed blood alone to pay the penalty for your sins. If you answer yes to those questions, you need to ask yourself further. All right, so yes, I know I'm a sinner. Yes, I know that, that my sin means I deserve death. Yes, I believe that. In fact, I'm broken over that. I grieve over that. I'm sorry about that. If that's where you're at. Then have you also then gone to Christ? If, is there any evidence, second part of the question, is there any evidence in your life that Christ has saved you from your sin? It is possible to say that you've believed in Christ, but to have an intellectual faith that does not save you. You must ask yourself, has God changed my heart? Before you used to live for yourself only, with no regard for Christ or for what he did on the cross, but now you love Jesus Christ and are flooded with gratitude because you know that he gave himself on the cross for you. 
before you had no hunger for holiness and where you were content to live in disregard of God's commands. Now, although you do fall into sin, right? Although you do fall into sin, now you mourn over your sins. You confess them. And you seek to please God by forsaking sin and obeying Him. Now your aim is to know Christ more and more. If you can honestly say, yes, those things are true of me, then God has begun a good work in my heart. That Then your, our text should bring you great joy and assurance. He who began a good work in you will perfect it unto the day of Christ. Jesus will save you from your sins. You're going to have a son, Joseph. You're supposed to call him Jesus. Yeshua. God saves. For he will save his people from their sins. That's Christmas. Do you believe it? Now, not just do you believe it here. Oh, yeah, I've accepted that. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah, all that. Is there evidence in your life that you're convicted when you sin, that you're broken by your sin, that you repent from your sin? And is there evidence in your life that you're living for Jesus Christ? And here's where the modern Christian church is in big trouble because too many of us just go to church and we don't share Jesus with our world. You see, if you believe that the only way to, to be bro forgiven is to have your sins paid for on the cross, and you believe that that's the only way to freedom is through Jesus Christ, and that you've accepted that, and you believe that the payment for your sin is not because of your good behavior, but by what Jesus did for you. If you believe that, then Jesus said, now, take what you've received, and go into all the world, and make disciples of all nations, and teach them to obey. We have a responsibility, folks, to get out there, and if we're not out there, then we probably should stop and ask ourselves, do I really believe? Because when I really believe, you can't hold it back, can you? When you really love somebody, do you keep it a secret? Yeah. <laughs> When Jesus has changed your life, you're not going to have to be afraid of, oh, should I talk to this person or not? What if I can't convince them? No, just let it out. Share the gift. Invite others to enjoy. If God is in your life, you can't hide him. And if you do, it'll be like putting a basket over a light that wants to shine in your world. Take it off and let the world see who Jesus is. Do you believe? Do you believe Jesus died for you? That you're a free person? Then let someone else know, especially this Christmas. Let someone else experience that too. You know what? Invite them to brunch next Sunday. Let's tell them, okay, we're doing something weird at our church. You're going to have food. <laughs> Come eat with us. Let's pray. God, I marvel at what you've done throughout history and the way you orchestrated everything to come together for you to come and dwell within a human being and, and then to walk here and perform miracles here and to set people free here, to die on a cross, to, to pay the price of sin and to rise from the dead to, to prove that you are God and to, to show that, that you could set people free and, to, and then to leave your Holy Spirit with us, meaning God is now dwelling within us. I marvel at all that, God. 
And I thank you for it. And I marvel that you love us so much that you came to set us free. And I pray, God, that I would never keep that a secret. I would never hold back, never resist sharing that love with somebody else. Even if their view of Christmas is 180 degrees different than mine, I pray that I would care enough to share the gift I've received. And I pray that that would be true of us as a church. And that Jesus, if today anyone is in this room who's maybe even said, oh yeah, I believe, but there's no change, no difference, that God, your spirit would call us to a new commitment, to a real faith, a life-changing experience with you dwelling inside of us. Come, Jesus, for anyone here who needs to receive you in a fresh way, who needs to make a new commitment. Say, okay, God, I realize you want me to be different and that you've saved me so I can be and that you've actually died for the sins I'm committing and God, I want to confess them to you and let go. God, I pray for each person here that the reality of the incarnation, the death, and the resurrection and the gift of the Holy Spirit would make us different in our world right now. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Do you have your bulletin? Please take it out. Please take the tear off off. Please let us know if you're going to be here next Sunday. Please let us know by signing up over there if you're going to bring some food for next Sunday so we know that we don't have to add a lot of water. <laughs> Do you believe in prayer? Do you believe that God answers prayer? In, in the birth of Jesus Christ, he did what was impossible for a virgin. God does what's impossible for us. Do you believe that? Are you willing to also let us pray for you? for what you might be facing. And, and this is one of those times, you know, I think sometimes we, get, we, we pray about all, you know, other people and their bunions and that kind of stuff. And I know bunions are uncomfortable. But, but frankly, what do you need prayer for? You personally, as you're going through this Christmas season, what do you personally need prayer for? W would you let us pray for you? Would you put that in the offering plate as a gift to God? This, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with this. This may be one of those things that I don't even know how you're going to do it, God. So here it is, Lord. May, maybe you do have somebody in your family that you're getting ready for Christmas and you know that they don't believe in Jesus. And you need God to anoint you, equip you, to love them in some special way so that hopefully they could see Jesus in you. Maybe you need to have prayer that, for that way. Something that's a lot bigger than, I'm sorry about bunions, but something bigger than bunions. Could we pray with you? And would you let us pray for you as you put that? Remember, people are hurting at Christmas time, aren't they? Did you hear it even in that, that, that long thing that I read, that blog from the atheist? This is a depressing time of the year for people. This is a time when people are cold and, and needy and needing a reason just to party. Well, people are hurting, aren't they? And frankly, without Jesus Christ, there is a, a lack of wholeness to life. Is there somebody that needs that that you know? Would you give that as a gift this year, this Christmas? And put that in the offering plate. Father, hear our prayers right now. In the next few moments, we're simply going to pray silently. Not just note our needs on these uh, prayer sheets but Lord there's some specific things we need to lift up to you and I pray for each person right now that we would open up our heart to heaven God even now you show us what, what is a burden on your heart in our life 
may we be honest, may we be open about that need as for the next few moments we now pray to you. And as we pray, God, you speak to us. So friends, take this as a moment of a blessing. Talk to God. He's listening. What an incredible blessing to know that you listen to us, God. That you care about what we care about. That you rejoice with the things we celebrate and that you even weep over the things that, that hurt our hearts. And that you're broken for our sin. And that you want us to have new life and new joy. And that you want to empower us to make a difference in our world. Thank you. In Jesus' name.